Hey folks, Joe here and welcome to The View and as you can see I'm delighted to be joined by uh, former Reading and Leeds United manager Brian McDermott. Brian, how are you doing? How's things? Joe, yeah, I'm very well, thank you. It's freezing cold over here. But it's I'm very freezing cold here. It's bloody cold here as well. It's, yeah. Yeah. Not built for it. <laughs> Me neither. Um, Brian, thanks for taking the time to, to talk to us. We, we wanted to kind of get a, a bit of an insight. I, I did see your interview with News Talk in Ireland this week, and I thought it was a really excellent interview and a great insight into, into yourself and to your time at Leeds as well. Um, obviously, there's Irish connections because, you know, your, your folks are from Ireland and, and you've, you've visited Ireland quite regularly. Do you want to give us a, a little insight into that? I won't talk too much with the Irish side because the, the bulk of people watching this will be in the UK anyway. So, But, um, yeah, talk about your, your Irishism. Yeah, no, I was born in uh, in Slough, Irish parents, um, mum's from Clare, dad's from Sligo, and uh, everyone on the street was Irish, so I know everything about the culture. Um, yeah, and uh, mum's grand, granddad's Irish, grandma's Irish, on both sides. Mm. So, yeah, it was difficult because we, I'd go over to Ireland, we'd got, we had, like, our family had a farm in Ireland, and we used to go there, and when they, they, I used to go over there, they used to call me English because I had an English accent. But come back here, I was plastic paddy, so <laughs> that was never easy. And my my my, my cousins actually have got a, have got a post office in Liston Barner of all places. No way, home of the uh, singles fair every year. Yeah, so it's the Jordan's post office. So if anyone wants to go and go into the Jordan's post office, that's in my family. Brilliant. Brilliant. And you come over here, you're back and forth a bit, are you? Yeah, no, years ago, all the time, not so much now. I used to do a lot of scouting in Ireland in um, mm. Friday nights when I used to come to uh, Dublin in particular and Cork, where we picked up, um, obviously, where we picked up Kevin, Kevin Doyle, yeah. Shane Long. We, who else did we take? Alan Bennett, Pierce oh, uh, Sweeney, we took. Um, yeah, J David Mooney. So we, we did really well scouting in Ireland. I get called a plastic corkman because I'm originally from Cork, but I have a Dublin accent from growing up in Dublin. My, my folk, my dad is, my dad was Irish. Sorry, my dad was from Cork. Oh, okay. <laughs> my, dad was Cork, my mom was from Dublin, so I, I um, identify as a Cork man, but I sound like a dub. So I get yeah. called plastic corkman. So I would be very aware of Cork City and, and the, the, the set. My, my uncle Charlie is a coach down in Cork as well. So um, he's involved with the um, Cork City women's team at the moment. So um, Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, then it starts to get very complicated. When you're talking yeah. about Cork as well, and uh, that's a lovely place as well. But this is great. It's my favourite country in the world. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Um, cool. So, Brian, we will get into this, and we we're going to talk a little bit. But we're going to get into you did career football and career at Arsenal. Um, and I want to kind of talk about how you got into coaching and managing before we get into the lead stuff and where your head was at with that. So when, when you when you were playing, was it something you always thought you would do? You would extend your career? I know you did scouting before you went into coaching as well. Or was it just something that as you got older, it was something that you decided developed into and wanted to do? No, I didn't know what I was going to do. To be honest, when I finished playing, I just I came back from um, Hong Kong. I was playing in Hong Kong and literally I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and I did one year selling life insurance for a company in London. And then I um, I was offered the chance to set up a football in the community scheme at, in Slough. And I did that for two years where I coached and I worked with different schemes. We did a lot of girls football. We did that on a Monday night. Um, and we were having probably 40, 30 to 40 girls train on a Monday night between 6.30 and 7.30. Um, in 1996, uh, seven, eight, whatever it was. So it was great. Um, and we did lots of different, I was coaching all the time. And eventually I ended up getting the job, the Slough Town Manager's job at national conference level. And I went from there to Woking. And then I went from Woking to, I left Woking and I was offered the under 17 job and chief scout job when Alan Pardew was at Reading. That was it. I never chased any of those jobs really. It was just, just everything just fell my way really that way. As far as I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I had my coaching badges. I started to get my coaching badges, did my B license, did my A license. And in 2011, 12, I did my pro, my pro license. So it kind of fell, fell into place really. Mm. Is it, <clears throat> was it something you enjoyed doing just as a, as a trade on its own? 
Um, yeah, I did actually. I enjoyed. I really enjoyed setting up the football in the community scheme. I mean, literally set up from nothing, and in the end, it was really successful, and I enjoyed that. Um, the, the the management at national conference level, I would say, you learn your trade. You know, you're training on a Tuesday and a Thursday night, and playing on a Saturday, and some days on the Thursday, you hardly got anywhere to train. Um, and you're doing everything. You're running around doing everything, you're scouting and everything, watching the opposition. <clears throat> so you learn. Um, I definitely learned a lot in that time. Mm. And then obviously going to Reading, I did every job at Reading. Um, I did the 17s, I did the 19s. I was reserve manager. In the, in the meantime, I was always the chief scout as well. Mm. And I liked, I really liked the doing that. I did. I combined the two together. Mm. I, and I suppose with, with every... Um, when you do a job like that and you're all in, something's got to suffer. So my family would have suffered. I was always out. I was out watching games everywhere. And, um, but yeah, I, 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 uh, I threw myself into that. I'm a bit of an obsessive. So I actually threw myself into all of those jobs and I eventually got the job at Reading in 2009. And a, and a great time for you at Reading as well. I mean, Championship winners played a lovely brand of football. Were an exciting team to watch. You know, went into the Premier League. Did reasonably well there as well. And um, what was that like getting promoted into the Premier League and then then managing and coaching in the Premier League? Well, you know, I've spoken about this many times. It's never it's never what you think it is. It's mm. um, we lost the playoff final in two thousand and eleven, and that was a massive blow. We lost to Swansea with Brendan. Brendan Rodgers was manager there, and uh, I, that that was hard coming back from that. And then the following year, I talk about this in the presentation I do, you know, what it was like trying to get myself up again and get the whole group up and all of us together managed to get ourselves promoted and win the league the following year and get promoted to the Premier League. And you think to yourself, well, this is it now. This is the be all and end all. You're one of 20 guys who are managing in the Premier League. And I think with success, there's always a, there's always a, um, there's always a price to pay. And I feel like I paid that. Um, looking back in hindsight but i've got i've got a real sort of i'm a bit i'm a lot kinder to myself now i look back at that and go you know i did okay and uh, the the group did okay and the, and the team did okay and the fans were together with the with the with the players so yeah it was it was um look premier league is incredible absolutely incredible it's one, you know it's the best league in the world I, when I was watching your interview at News Talk, and you, you talked about stuff has to suffer as well. And, and during that period of time when you were moving from Reading and you, you, you took on the Leeds job in April, what was it, 2013, you took the job with Leeds. There was stuff going on in the background at that stage as well. What was what was that like? What, where was your head at going into that role? Well, so I didn't... There was about five games to go at Leeds and I really wanted to wait a little bit longer to give myself a bit more time. You know, I lost my job in the March 2013 and... and they wanted me to go in the April 2013 with five games to go because the club was on a bit of a losing run. Mm. And we were a little bit concerned about dropping into the, the bottom bit. So um, my head was like, I wanted to go, but to cut a long story short, a good friend of mine was there, Neil Redfern was there. He was talking about, he wanted me to come and uh, the club wanted me to come. And I and I took Nigel Gibbs, my assistant, and, and we ended up going there in uh, with, for the last five games of the season. We won three and lost two, so we, we got enough to get out of trouble. Um, and that they were very good, the Leeds fans, very, very good. That You know, I remember the first game we played Sheffield Wednesday. We were 1-0 down, I think, and uh, we managed to win the game 2-1. Then we played Burnley and Sean Dyche was in charge and we won the game 1-0. So sort of, that sort of saved us, really. That, was, that made sure we were safe. And then we could build for the following season, really. So where was my head at? My head was at... Just go in there and do what you got to do to get enough results to make sure everything we, we were safe in the league. That was where my head was at. Mm. The um the ownership of the club was at a very volatile kind of point over those couple of years that you, that you were there before, just before, and then again just after again as well. When you went into Leeds, it was it was GFH Capital, I believe, were 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 the owners of Leeds at the time. What what was that ownership model like, and what was Leeds like behind the scenes at that time? Um, it's really hard to say. Um, I think, you know, when I went in there, I thought, well, you know, there was, there was a bit of money in the summer, so that was good. Um, I think that, that, that kind of summertime with leading into the first game of the season against Brighton, people say it was as good as it would, had been for a long time. Um, 
And I remember we won the first game of the, the season against Brighton, 36,000 people at Ellen Road. And we, we won with the last kick of the game. And uh, that was amazing. I, you know, that it was, it was a league game, 1-1, last kick of the game. Luke Murphy scores a goal. Yeah. And literally, if there was a roof on the stadium, it would have come off. And uh, it it was incredible, real incredible um, feeling in that in that state. And we actually started the season pretty well. First four or five months, we were like in December, we were fifth in the league or something like that. And then it all went a bit. It went um, it went wrong, big yeah. time. But yeah, and- as far as they were concerned, uh, they weren't easy. Let's put it that way. Hmm. There's lots of you hear lots of things going on behind the scenes of using football manager, the computer game to to find players and scout players. And there was no scout network at the club at the time or there was just the infrastructure was wasn't great. Or one of the directors, you know, bringing journalists in the area and asking them, like, would you recommend players or what player should we be looking at bringing in? Was that actually the case that what was going on there at the time or were they just stories coming out of the club and actually it was, it was much calmer behind the scenes? No, that, that wasn't really the case with GFH. They weren't bringing in players. Um, you know that they were uh, they were very much in the background as far as away from from the football club, really. So, no, I mean the, the, there was a sort of um, underlying pressure um, from from them as far as you know, expecting to win, expecting to win, expect you know, having this feeling that a new manager's coming in, we're we're doing all right. Now we're going to get promoted. That's how it's going to work. And it hadn't worked like that at Leeds for a long time, and it's it was it was years. I mean, that that was my big thing really, as far as going to Leeds. I wanted to be part of something where massive club like that goes back to the Premiership, and and obviously, Bielsa took them back in years, a few years later, which was incredible, and he did a brilliant job. Um, so look, you know, um, it, it was messy, really messy when they sold the football club. They, it was really messy, and I and I, I had a I had a really not I had a really bad vibe when when the football club was sold. I didn't feel it was. I, I was really uncomfortable when it was sold. I just I knew that it wasn't right in my in my, my to my core. Mm. It was. Um, I think we were all the same at that time when we saw what was coming in and we'd seen the history of of who was looking at taking over. I think we all were a little bit nervous about where we were going to go. But you'd gone through a situation where you would had Ken Bates in charge for Leeds and uh, for years, and Leeds just you know dropping like a stone through the divisions. And then you have GFH come in, and it's you think we're getting a, a Middle Eastern bank taking over here finally in the big time here with money, and you find out that the only Middle Eastern bank in the world with no money. Yeah. And then you see an Italian um, agricultural businessman coming in um, very, very much a uh, show pony in terms of just, you know, uh, being in front of cameras and stuff and just a bit of nervousness there. You're in the club and then deadline day in January kicks in and all hell seems to break loose at the club. Chilino's in as owner, but not fully confirmed. Um, We've get news that apparently you've been let go by the club. Then there's Ross McCormick pops up on Sky Sports News talking about what's going on and not being happy here and possibly leaving. And then all the fans turn up at Ellen Road to, and, and pretty much barricade Chilino into the stadium. Um, where Again, just back to where your head was that during this, because it just seemed to be a crazy couple of days and a couple of hours. And then we, we beat Huddersfield, McCormick sort of a hat-trick, and then the following um, Monday morning, there's a press conference and you're back in the job. Mm. You're sitting there. And I'll never forget you walking into the press conference and looking at Bryn Law and saying, didn't expect to see me here this morning. And yeah. um, what was that whole period, like that couple of days, like for you? Um, looking back, it was carnage as far as everything was concerned. But it was trying to the best of my ability keep my head in the game, and that was not easy at that time. Um, I mean, you got to remember that January was a great, was a ter- was a was a terrible month for us. Mm. You know, we'd got beat by Sheffield Wednesday. We got beat by Rochdale. Rochdale in the cup got smashed by Sheffield Wednesday. It was a really not a good month. Um, and we'd kind of fallen away a little bit. I think eighth or ninth in the league, whatever it was. Um, I got a phone call on the 31st on, on, on transfer deadline day to say that I'd been, re, uh, I'd been, re, uh, re, um, ter- my contract had been terminated from a lawyer who I didn't know. Um, and I just rang a friend and I said, I've just been sacked. 
Um, and then I spoke to Nigel Gibbs and I think they were talking to Nigel and they were talking to Neil Redfern and I thought Giuliano Festa was going to take the team. I didn't have a clue. Then it reverted back to Nigel and Neil taking the team. Um, and then obviously we won the game. And then during the game, during that time, I, I was going to go back for the game up until about two o'clock that day. Game was at three yeah. and it was still negotiations about me going back to the, for the game and it didn't pan out that way. And I would have gone back. I was ready to go back. Um, and then obviously we did the press conference at one o'clock in the afternoon, which was live. That was a live press conference, which was 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, but it was just, it was, uh, it was crazy. Absolutely crazy. I mean, Chilino didn't own the football club at the time. So he didn't take the club until March. So he wasn't in a position to actually suck anybody. Mm. Um, so, look, what can you say? I mean, you know, this is the history. The Leeds fans go to the to the ground that night, um, and they made their feelings known. Not, not not necessarily about me, but but I think more about. I think it was more about how the club was being run. You know, it's not that wasn't. I, I didn't think that was about how great a manager I was. It was definitely not that. It was more about, come on, this isn't the way to run our football club. Um, and that's how I saw that, really. Um, and, and the thing about Leeds fans, and you'd know better than me, but, you know, they've got an amazing loyalty to their football club. They've got a great passion and loyalty. Um, and actually, I get treated really well by Leeds fans, which is really nice, because they didn't do anything at Leeds. You know, we we, we didn't, I didn't do what I wanted to do there, but... You know, I've, I've got a great time for for the for the for the football club and the fans. Really have. You say that, but I remember that time relatively fondly in terms of actually because we were fifth in the league at one point, and it did look like the playoffs were an option. It did look like we could push on, and then what happened happened. But I think you were you were remembered pretty fondly by a lot of Leeds fans. I know from during that period of time, there was a lot of managers came in, especially when, when Chino got his hands on the club fully. There was a ton of managers came in over a short space of time. So at that point, I mean. You were one of the few managers I think Leeds Sounds were at the time we're talking about, like shouldn't have been sacked, should be kept on, should be brought back, you know, yeah. which doesn't happen with every manager comes into Leeds. A lot of Leeds managers come in and they're kind of happy to see them go when they go, but yeah. it didn't seem to be the case with you. And and still seems to be the case that a lot of people that I've spoken to over the last couple of days talking about you, they've said the same thing. It's like, oh, I really like Brian McDermott as manager. I thought we'd actually do something that 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 year. Yeah. So you are you are held in, in in relatively high esteem by by the Leeds manager, which is a tough just tough for any manager at any club to be, you know, after they got, especially when Leeds were still in the championship at that point. But um, what was the relationship like with Chilena? Like, what was he like to work for? Because you went back and you had that period till the end of the season. But what, what was he like to actually work with? And also, did the G, actually, before we get to that, did the GFH and Chilena sale stuff going on in the background, was that a factor that contributed to the, I suppose, the season turning a corner in the wrong direction? Well, there was no way we could do any. I don't, you know, doing it. I tried to sign um, Ashley Barnes from. I can't remember what, where it was. Who ended up at Burnley yeah. and Barnes? Um, it was two hundred and fifty grand, and I knew Barnes's agent really well. It was based soccer, and he wanted to go to Leeds. And I said, look, it's two hundred and fifty grand. We got some. He's going to bring some pace to the team, and he works his socks off. Be great with Ross, um, and he wouldn't do it. So they'd made it. So I think the deal was going to be done between them and Chilino. So they weren't going to invest any more money in the team at the time, which is back to them. Mm. Uh, and then, 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 then what happened happened. Um, so how did I get on with Massimo Cellino? Um I, I don't know how I got on with him. He, 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 he was, he was. He, Massimo, I think the thing is, I was a manager. And he his his thought process for the club was different to mine. Uh, I came in as the football manager, where I could be involved in the recruitment and different bits and bobs, which I always did as a manager. And he wanted to be the manager without being on the touchline. So that was the thing he wanted to bring in the players, and that was not what I was used to, and what wasn't what I signed up for. So that was. But then he was the owner, you know. So. Um, I knew once I once he made that decision in May, in in, March, in January that I was going to go. I was going to go at the end of the season, and I have to be honest. By the time the end of the season came, I I was pretty broken. Um, I knew it was coming. The last five games we had, we won three, drew one, lost one. Um, so like my record towards the end, when he, funny enough, when 
the place settled a little bit when he actually bought the club. But I didn't like what happened at back end of the season. Mm. Uh, that was the one thing about him which I, I don't think was which was wrong mm. when he said I went on holiday. I was going back to see my mum, and uh, mm. you know my mum wasn't well, and and I had to go and see her, so I wanted to get back, and I, I had no way of coming back, and I wasn't interested in engaging at that time. I wanted to see my mum, and my mum was dying, and my mum died in the June, and that was wrong. Uh, what happened there? And I, you know, you try not to take anything personally in football, but that felt personal. Having said that, he wrote to me after my mum died to say sorry about my mum dying, which I did appreciate. I really did. Yeah, because he he'd said to Leeds fans, and remember doing the press conference, it was around the time where he was systematically taking Torp Arch apart. He drained the swimming pool. He'd taken all the staff out of Torp Arch. Players were bringing their own lunches in. It was just running on a shoestring. And then he did that press conference where he said you'd gone on holiday and were uncontactable, essentially yeah. saying that you had abandoned Leeds and you you know weren't coming back and this was your fault. Which yeah. clearly wasn't the case. Like that, that, that stings. That has to hurt. That did hurt, and I, 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 that felt personal, and that felt political rather than, you know, this is, you know, what we're doing is for the best for the club. You know, if you're going to let me go, just let me go. That's fine. Just do what you got to do, but don't make it personal. And that's what happened at that time. Um, but you know what? I look back at it, and, and and I don't hold resentments over it. He wrote the letter to me later on after he found out that my mum had died. And I really appreciated that. And I think that was important for me that he did that. Uh, I wasn't looking for apologies from him or anything like you weren't going to get one. And I, didn't, I wasn't looking for any of that. Listen, the only way, the reason I went home was to look after my mum, to be with my mum. That was it. And any Leeds fan and any person at Leeds would have done exactly the same. And at that point, set, football's got to come second. And it did. Um, but I also, you know, I did leave a message to say that, I, that I've got to get out. I've got to see my mum. So anyway, it, it, it was then and it's in the past. Um, but it, it was a shame that he 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 did go down that road because that was not the road to go down. Now, <clears throat> he went in the road with a couple of people as well. It seemed to be just, just this kind of his very reactionary style to everything was to try and firefight it and get out ahead of it and make it look like he was in the in the, you know, he was the good person in the situation. And he did that quite a lot. But when, when you look back at your time at Leeds, how, how do you look back at it? Oh, it's um so I'll tell you what happened to me recently, about eight years ago, no, about seven years ago, a friend of mine was in America and uh, he lived next door to me when I was growing up as a kid and he, he hadn't seen me for all these years and he, I met him in London and the first thing he said to me, he went, you managed Leeds United and it was like, because, you know, he remembered Billy Bremner, he remembered Johnny Giles, he remembered the players walking out and waving to the fans. He remembered the socks with the tassels. tassels yeah. You know, and I remembered that as well. And he went, you remember, you, you managed Leeds, Don Revy, you managed Leeds. And I thought about that and I thought, yeah. And I do look back at that now again. That was a really difficult time. The, first, the last four months at, uh, at Leeds was emotionally one of the most difficult times I've ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. And I probably was at breaking point then for a number of reasons, but, you know, that's kind of summed it up. He went, you managed this night. He looked at me and I thought, yeah, fair play. You know, you, you, it, 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 is a, it is a monster club. And and, I, and I'm proud of the fact that I managed Leeds and I'm proud that I managed Reading and Slough and Woking you know, to be a manager. And I went back recently to watch the Man United, the Leeds Man United game. And there was a few people from coaches and directors of football and CEOs from America. A lady sat next to me and said, you stood on that line down there. I thought, yeah, I did, yeah. That is quite incredible because it's a, it's a massive club. It really is a big club. And mm. I hope everything goes all right this year and you just get over the line this year to make sure you stay up. Yeah, fingers crossed. It's it's looking a bit brighter <clears throat> currently. After, mm. Well, it's only one game, but it's it's, it's looking. Garcia seems to have settled things down a little bit. So, um, yeah, Brian, I wanted to talk a bit about your your, your scouting as well briefly because I want to get onto the, the mental health stuff that you're doing now because I think it's an important conversation to have as well. But... You, you, you went back to Arsenal, well, you went to Reading, back to Reading, and then you went back to Arsenal as, as a scout and then international scout there. Um, do you keep tabs on young players still, and especially yeah. around Leeds? There's two sides I wanted to ask you about this. One, the current crop of Arsenal young players that's come through that Mikel Arteta is working with are yeah. an incredible group of players. Um, were you involved in the scouting or the team involved in the scouting of those players? And what did you guys look for when you were looking to bring those young players in? Yeah, so it's interesting actually what's happened with them. Like Saliba, very much involved in that. Um, 
with players like that, you know, that came through at that time. Gabriel knew him really well from Lille. Um, Vieira, I didn't know. Um, he was Davis one they brought in. Um, but but we had a sort of way of doing things. My job was to go to watch all the the, the, the players that the scouts in the different countries had been flagging up. And I just went and flew off and watched these players play. Um, so I, I was just going, yeah, I believe. And then I went go back to the bosses at Arsenal and say, yeah, I think we really need to take this seriously, et cetera, et cetera. But what they've done now is they've got the ages, the age group down, like, you know, Saliba's 21 years of age, 22 years of age, centre-half, can be there for the next 10 years. Uh, great combinations. He, he's got great combinations. Odegaard as well. Knew mm -hmm. Odegaard since he was 15. I think he was in the building when he was 15. At, mm -hmm. at so, um, uh, Martinelli, um, he was flagged up by the Brazilian scouts, fourth division player in... in and I was asked to watch him on video by my boss, Franny Caccio. And Martinelli on the he could run forward as quick as back he could run back as quick as he could run forward and you look at a player with a great attitude defensively wanted to run forward run back so all of these players and Trossard I knew Trossard from Ghent and I really loved Trossard I, I had lunch with his his family his agent um, but Trossard was probably one of these players that needed another club before he came to Arsenal yeah. and he grew when he went to Brighton but fabulous player. So there's always a story behind every player, but um, yeah, he's doing a great job there. And I'm going to watch. I'm going to watch them on. The, I'm going to watch them against Everton this week. There's a there's a guy that I that I work with called Chris Smith. We we we're trainers in our in our jobs. Um, and Chris has a model that that he, he worked in. Simon Sinek did it as well, and it was a KSA knowledge, skills, and attitude. And it's a kind of a recruitment model that you you know knowledge you'll learn skills you can be taught but attitude is all about you if you have a, the right attitude when you're scouting players where do you rate talent versus attitude is it attitude first talent second or talent first attitude second or do you look for that at all attitude first talent second yeah you know you need to know that they're playing that they are good people i always try and sign i mean the team that got promoted with reading um i used to say back in the day when i did used to drink I would, one of the criteria for me is I'd go and have a drink with this fella because he's such a good fella. Mm -hmm. And I'd have had a drink, a drink with every single one of those players that got promoted with me. Um, just wonderful people. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's I see the person first and the, and the player second. And I think that's vitally important. What have you, what person have you got? What's inside that person? Um, so for me, that's massive. I've seen so many talented players just miss, just not, not just don't get it don't get that it's about team first and for me it's always team first do you keep an eye on the leads young players that have come through obviously leads are doing something similar at the moment bringing a lot of young players into the club at, at under 21 age and, and trying to develop them there before they before they just hit that you know breakthrough moment they're trying to grab them just before is there any leads young players you've kept an eye on or seen that you that you're so, I, so i watched that documentary about academy kids yeah it's great Great, and I really like that. Love those kids, you know, coming mm. through. It's a brilliant um, documentary. So, you know, I look keep my eye on those young kids coming through and keeping my eye out from. I mean, I just taken them because this is. I do lots of different things now. Um, I do mentoring for managers and coaches, and with the League Managers Association, and I do my presentation. I did my presentation recently in Dublin, mm. which was great. Uh, a company called ESB, lovely yeah. people. And um, and also I, I I scout the lower leagues over here to watch young players, and I put a young boy into Orient who now has gone on loan to a team called Kings Langley. He signed a year and a half contract. It's, it's really good, great attitude, great parents, family, granddad. So I keep my eye out for young youngsters just to try and get them a chance, because uh, for me, uh, it gives me a bit of purpose. Yeah. You know, when you become a little bit older like I am, it's really important. I know what I'm going to do on a daily basis and I've got a bit of purpose. Routine. Uh, and I think that's massive for me. Did you, um, did Sam Greenwood come across your radar while he was at, at Arsenal before he moved to Leeds? Yeah, I knew about Sam Greenwood and obviously went, was it Sunland as well? Yeah, so, yeah, he looks a, a good type. I like him. Um, and there was like, there's moments now when you look at it and think, well, actually, I went to see the game the other day um 
Banford was playing, and I think Greenwood might have come on actually. I'm not sure. He came on at the end of the game, yeah. Yeah, he did, yeah. So, yeah, he looks a good type, looks a good lad. Cresswell looks a good guy. Yeah. Uh, been out on loan. Um, so, yeah, you've got all of these ones coming through, and all you need is one or two. If you can get one a year, you're doing all right. Yeah, yeah, we're the same. I, I, I coach an amateur team called Bormie and Celtic in Ireland, and we're kind of, it's only my first year with the club, and we're trying to put a kind of a style in place of how we want to play from the top down. But mm-hmm. also we've got um, a, a program in Ireland called the Emerging Talents Program, where it's it's the kind of the better kids that you underage kind of come together at their age group with the FEI and, and train with with top coaches. And then I think we've got two players at each level currently now that are that are in the ETP squad. So we're kind of looking at having, if we can get one or two of these to come through every year, then the whole club just kind of, kind of grows um, and we don't have to go out looking for players we can bring them through ourselves so it's a huge part of what we're trying to do now as well I think it, it kind of did it's the the footballing drip effect it's you, you see it being done professionally at the top and it starts to just drip down through the leagues and the levels and you want to emulate that as well so yeah it's um it's good to see Brian you're, you you talked about having routine and, and, and a structure to your life now and keeping yourself busy you do a lot of stuff around mental health and, I, and I'd love to speak to you about this because obviously for a long time for a lot of players mental especially with men mental health is just something we're rubbish at dealing with and talking about we don't talk about problems and, and issues enough as we should and um, but you look at football now with sports psychologists and clubs and, and that how important or, or talk to me a little bit about what you're doing around mental health currently and then we'll talk about how important you think that is um, for footballers nowadays well i think it's really important i think um so i'm doing i think i'm doing five six mental health presentations this month my presentation that I do and all my presentation is is a journey from the age of six to the age of what I am today I'm not a, I'm not an advisor I'm not a counselor I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist all I can do is talk about what I've done and how it's been for me I remember at the age of uh, 12 11 12 I was at Queen's Park Rangers I wasn't feeling good on one particular day and I walked up to one of the coaches and I said, I'm not good today. I don't know what's wrong with me. And he went, you've got to be good every day. You've got to be right. You've got to be every day. You've got to be on it. You've got to be on it. And that was 1971. And the next time I opened up to anyone was 2015. Wow. So it, it kind of just sort of gravit- the, the gravitas of what he said. And maybe I'm a sensitive 11, 12 year old um, who shouldn't have took that on. And, but that's what happened. So it's it's kind of like I always think, um, you know, it's how you make someone feel. If, you know how what do you say that makes someone feel like I'm not going to talk anymore? Mm. That's a scary place to be. You know, if he'd have said to me, "I oh, tell me what's going on," and had a conversation, I would, might might have been a different person. Who knows? You can't put it all on one person. It's crazy. But the reason I do my talks today, and sometimes I don't want to do it, Joe. Sometimes I don't want to go out and do it. And I think, well. I might be able to help one person in the room or two people in the room. I get, I always leave my email and I always say, come and talk to me or phone me or whatever, because that's my purpose. Um, so, yeah, and, and I talk about anxiety. I talk about um, not feeling good enough. I talk about imposter syndrome. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I, I never play for Ireland, you know, and I feel like, oh, if only I had one cap for Ireland, I could show everyone my shirt. My, and and I, I think about it like, uh, for the last 40 odd years, it's like crazy, this narrative going on in my head. And I used to drink a lot of alcohol off the back of that, you know. I don't belong there, don't belong here, don't belong anywhere. You know, I've got an English accent, and my blood's Irish, no one knows. I, mean, I, I go to Dublin, I, when I get in the car, in Dublin, in a taxi, I get in the car, and the other day I did it. Lady driving me, and I start saying my name and I said, oh, where are you going? And then I go, oh, my mum's from Clare, my dad's from Sligo. And I start telling them my story. And I think I'm a nutter. And it's just <laughs> trying to sort of, it's just trying to say, I belong here. Belong here. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to say I belong. It, it, and I still do it. I still do it to this day. And I have to check myself, you know. I just go, listen, you're fine. You're fine. Mm. No one's judging you. You're fine who you are. Um. I don't know if that answered your question at all. It does. It's it's tough. You touched on something there that I, I'd like to ask you about as well because we we do it with our with the trainers that myself and Chris train for for the company that we work for. Um, we do an awful lot around this as well, and, and we we talk not mental health as such, but more more imposter syndrome. Right. Um, and I would suffer pretty badly with imposter syndrome. I have this fear on a regular basis of someone's going to figure out at some point that I'm not good at what I do or 
that I shouldn't be in the job that I'm in or I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Like any minute now, someone's going to go, hang on a second. Yeah. And that's always in the back of my head. And I, and I refer back to the little uh, mobile anxiety boxes that we have in our pockets as well. And, and the fear of a negative comment on, on a social media platform that can just spiral you. And I could be sitting down having dinner with my, with my partner. And all of a sudden I remember something that somebody said to me when I was 17 years of age, and that will stay in my head for two or three days and will put me into a, a downward kind of spiral. And I've gone and talked to people about it. And it's, it's the best thing that I ever did was, was to go and, and sit down and, and talk to somebody about stuff and talk about what, what, you know, stuff I went through as a kid. And, um, it's huge, but imposter syndrome, I think, is an awful lot more common than people think it is. I think a lot more people suffer from it um, and don't see the value necessarily in themselves that that they that they do have. And um, how much do you spend? How much time do you spend is better around imposter syndrome, or, or where does that sit with you and your career as uh, with imposter syndrome? Central, central, and you know, the thing for me was what I was trying to do as as a player was kind of constantly fight not feeling good enough and not belonging. Don't want to feel like this. Don't want to feel like this. Okay, how do I not feel like this? Okay, I'll take a drink. If I take a drink, then it stops me from feeling like this because it numbs all my feelings. Mm. So actually the problem with alcohol is it numbs your imposter syndrome and you feel, okay, that's all right. But it numbs any other feelings as well. So, you know, you can't be happy. You can't be loving. You can't be this because you've got no feelings. Mm. When you get to that chronic stage when you're just drinking to numb your feelings alone, like, you know, if, if you're drinking because it's a social occasion and you're having a bit of a crack and you're having a good time, that's different. Mm. But if you're doing it for the wrong reasons, I, I'm doing it to numb my feelings, then you have to look at that and go, well, this ain't a great place to be. Um, so I, I tell you what I do now. You know, I have moments where I think I'm talking to Jer and I'm not interesting and I don't belong. Who's got any, who cares what I've got to say? You know, these feelings, and it's just feelings, I let them go. I just let them go. I know the feelings, let it go. Mm. Because, you know, they're just feelings. They're not, it's not the truth. The truth is I'm just sat here with you having a chat. Mm. That's the truth. And you're talking, and I'm, I'm talking, and we're listening to each other, and, and that's nice. And that's all we need to, to worry about. And I've kind of got to that situation in my life now where I just note my feelings and let it go and don't fight it. I've just got to... Uh, I've got, a, in the last eight years, I've learned so much. I've got a great acceptance of things now for what they are. And I don't beat myself up like I used to. Not so much. Yeah, my, um, the, I went to, a, I went to see a psychotherapist because I want, I needed feedback. They're very good at giving feedback. Um, and one thing she said to me was, um, give yourself a break. Yeah. Stop being so hard on yourself. You know, yeah. you're, you're not what you think you are. Yeah. You know, give yourself a, give yourself a minute. Brian, how, how important do you think sports psychologists and just psychologists in general are now in the modern football, given the amount of, I suppose, exposure players have to fans? It's, it's now not a case of, well, I might get a bit of abuse in the stadium and I might get a bit in the local town that I'm playing and walking down the street. But now it's global. Now it's social media. Now it's, you know, TV. It's it's everywhere. You're, you're, you're open 24-7 to everybody. Mm. How, how important do you think that is for them, that for players to have that support in their clubs now versus saving the past? So this is cotton. There's a nuance to this. So I think I think this is a, a, a really difficult area. You got sports psycho. A, a, a football club brings a sports psychologist into the football club. You got the players who know that the sports psychologist is working for the club. The players are reluctant to speak to the sports psychologist because the sports psychologist in the player's mind is going to speak to the manager about what's been said. Now, there's confidentiality with sports psychologists. So, you know, you would assume that wouldn't be the case. Mm. Um, so, but the players don't know that. Or the player tells the sports psychologist what the manager wants to hear. Yeah. That's a problem in itself. So there's your problem. So, So my view would be this. So, for example, Stephen Reid, you know Stephen Reid, Republic mm. of Ireland International, wonderful man, I love him, great guy. He's doing out a lot of talks at the moment. did one on the pro license yesterday, funny enough. And I want to get together with Stephen. We're going to try and do some stuff. We, we actually talked about going to Ireland to do some stuff on this. Um, and I'd love to do that with Stephen. Um, I think people like Stephen, to, people with lived experience, not having the name of the club on their badge, just walking into the club, and just being around the place, maybe speak to one or two of the lads, 
what you're going through, how's it going? Because he's lived in that jerk, that world. Mm -hmm. I've lived in this world since I was six years of age. You know, I get it. And uh, the one thing I get is football. I understand all the stuff that goes on. So actually, players coming out of the game, you know, players retiring, players that, you know, I've got my mentoring course thing that I've just done with the LMA, being able to talk to players and understand the players and, and for the players to be heard. I think the sports psychologist one is a difficult one because um, if you employ them, I know the feeling from the players some of the time is I'm scared of saying something to him mm. because of he might say something. Now, I, I know that's not the case, but that's a that's a perspective of a player. Mm. But do you think it's important that players do open up now? Because yes. again, again, because of the mental exposure they have. Yes, 100% got to speak to somebody. I wish I'd have done it. But then I wish I had a sort of a mentor of a manager back in the day when I needed it or as a player when I was 18, 19. You know, I couldn't talk to my dad. My dad would just say, well, what does the coach say? Well, the coach is shouting at me or, yeah. you know, and it was there was a lot of fear back around when I played. There was lots of fear. You not might not get a new contract. Everything was fear-based. Um, I mean, I remember looking back at it, Joe, and I, I just think sometimes, you know what? I think the job of the manager is to make me as bad as they, they possibly can. It's a really yes. weird thing to say. Mm -hmm. But I remember certain managers thinking, it's his job to make me worse. Because mm. that's how I felt. Um, and, you know, it, it's a strange thing to say. But even now, I sometimes think, God, I wouldn't have said that to that lad, you know. You're trying to make him, you're trying to build him up and trying to give him a bit of confidence and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and ranting and raving and shouting and swearing at people is not the answer. No, I was I was lucky when I did play that I, I had some very good managers. Um, but then I had a couple of managers whose whose way of managing me was you play best when you're angry. So my job is to make sure that you've always got a point to prove, which which ultimately just made me angry all the time because it was of, of, of where they were going with it. So it's yeah i think if the game has changed i would have been an issue when i went from being a player into coaching initially i would be a shouter and baller mostly from, from frustration on the sideline but i've tried my best over the last couple of years to off the sideline and in training to be able to talk to players one-on-one -on -one and have these conversations with them and there's a couple of guys that i've got right now currently who who have had some really nice conversations with and you can see the difference that it makes you know they they, they, they do appreciate that and it's, it is it's part of your job. Your part of your job is not only to develop them as players, but to develop them as people as well, especially young players coming through. So mm. it's hugely important. Um, Brian, highs and lows of your time at Leeds. What were your high points there? Where do I Well, I think the first game of the season, Brighton, when we won the game. Um, yeah, and, you know, I, I struggle with them questions because it's like... Um, even 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 if you went back to Reading and you say highs and lows, you know, you'd say, well, actually, you know, we won the playoff, we lost the playoff final. That would have been, a, I assume that was a low. Mm -hmm. Actually, you won promotion to the Premiership. Actually, and I talk about this in my presentation, that was one of the lowest times of my life. How does that work? Mm -hmm. But initially you think, oh, everything's going to be fixed because I'm now a Premier League manager. That wasn't yeah. the case. Um, there was a lot of low points as far as how I was emotionally at Leeds trying to get through the day. I mean, because I was trying to manage a situation, I was trying to manage the ownership and what was going on. Mm. It was a time when the players and staff weren't getting paid. So we're trying to do that it was a low point. Obviously, that was a low point when when the chair, the, the guy, they tried to sell the football club. And that three or four months between January, February, March um, was really low, difficult. And then we... And then I kind of had an acceptance of, well, actually, I know I won't be here. You know, I, I'm done here. Whatever happens, I win the next five games, five nil, it's not going to happen. So the, the high points, I would say, of Leeds would have been the people, you know, and the fact that they were so, um, I don't know what they were, loyal, um, amazing fan base away from home, incredible, um, all of these things, really. Just It was more the people than the stuff that happened on the pitch. Because the stuff that happened on the pitch, there wasn't any massive highs. We won a game against Brighton, first game of the season, in the last minute. That was great. But generally, it was about the people and, yeah. and about the area that I lived in. And, and uh, to this day, I'll always have a lot of um, a lot of time for, for the fans and supporters at Leeds United. 
you, you were close with Redders and Lucy Ward while you were there. Mm. Good people. Great people. I mean, Redders came and Redders carried on doing his bit with the academy. He was great with the academy kids. And then uh, he jumped up with me as well and we travelled up to all the games together. We're good friends. Lucy, I didn't know, but she was amazing. She was she she looked after all the players. She brought all those young players mm -hmm. through. Um, I remember her first commentary that she did in 2013, and she was nervous about doing her first commentary session. And now she's up there as she's she up there as one of the top yeah. co-commentators in the game. Um, oh, you know, I've got so much time for those two. They're lovely people. Yeah, I'm so pleased to where Lucy's got to in in her career as well. And uh, I, I like Lucy's take on things. I, I like the fact that she has that insight into the young people's development as well. Like I like I like when she's talking about young players coming through. I, yeah, I think she's excellent. Yes, uh, Brian, yeah. before I let you go, um, because this has gone way longer than I expected, um, but I'm just enjoying talking to you. But um, any any desire to get back into coaching or management, or are you? Is that in the past now when you're you're just focusing on what you're doing now? Yeah, I'm not, I don't, it's like I said to you, I've never chased anything as far as work-wise in my life. I've got this, I'm, I'm doing my presentation, I'm going to maybe do something with Stephen soon, Stephen Reid. Hmm. I'm doing, looking after a few, a, lung, a young lad at the, the Boy at Orient, I might try and find one or two others. I'm, I'm mentoring a few um, uh, managers and coaches, which is great. So I'm, I'm as long as I'm, I've got a purpose in the morning when I wake up. That's good enough for me. Mm. If something comes that I quite like, then we'll see what happens, really. Um, but I don't think that people are going to be queuing up to, to, to bring me in as manager these days as a 61-year-old fella. Because for me, I, I, I never really wanted to be a head coach, so to speak. I wanted to be the manager and then try to be involved with a lot of the club, the academy, the scouting, um, all the stuff that goes on. And that doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah. It's generally the head coach, and then you've got other people doing all the other stuff. Yeah, that's definitely changed. Uh, last question, Brian, before you go. Um, and this is just a person. I'm going to steal some of your knowledge, hopefully. But just for any young coaches, or I'm not young, but any young coaches getting into the game, any advice for them? Well, just see the person first. You know, if you, you know, the idea of a coach is to be a facilitator. It's not about you. It's about the. It's about you facilitating the best you can be for those players. So your purpose is to serve, for want of a better word, the players. Mm. You know, the coaching session is not about the coach, it's about the players. And that's the key. And, and speak to people in, in a way that um, just try to make the players feel special. And I think that's really, really important. You know, you don't, you never know what's going on in someone's life. You never know what's going on in, on any player's life or anyone's life until you actually um, ask the question and you listen to the answer. And listening is pretty important. It's a skill in itself and it's a skill that you have to train yourself to do as well. Listening is not always the active listening specifically because uh, it doesn't come necessarily easy to everybody. So, yeah, it is a skill. Brian, massive thanks um, for taking time out of your day to, to speak to us today. I really appreciate this um, and uh, have a great day. Thank you, Joe. You take care of yourself. Cheers, mate.